Good morning. It's about time to start, so thanks for tuning in to Patch Management, Cornerstone of Cybersecurity. My name is Joe Cummins. I wanted to start off by admitting this is a selfish presentation. It's a collection of things I have learned over the last 20 years that make my job easier. Most of the content is based off basic computer practices. If you've been working in IT for a few years, much of the content will sound familiar. It really is about managing basics. But the spin I want to put on it is how to manage, is how managing these things can help reduce the time and energy it takes to run a monthly patch process. Turns out those things also help reduce time and effort for some security processes as well. Most of the presentation is black and white, except for a few color, color slides, see if you notice them. I was also intrigued with slide transitions. So warning, uh, some of them might be a little goofy. The first group of slides about me, where I worked, what I learned. Next group of slides um, is about those things that relate to patching. The last group is about the process and how those things can affect it. So you may ask yourself, because I ask myself this all the time, same job for 20 years, how'd you do that? Well, fortunately, I landed at a few great companies along the way, and the tools and techniques used to secure a workstation have changed enough in that time to keep it interesting. I've also been consulting on the side for decades. The evolution of securing a business is constantly changing. You must be ready. I spent hours researching new technologies, investing, investigating patch issues, researching vulnerabilities, and keeping up with the latest cybersecurity news. At this point, I'd like to find out who I was talking to, but I don't think I'll be able to do that. So I'm going to assume that we are all interested in patching and that you have a process in place and like want to improve it or you're starting a process. I do want to emphasize this is a workstation patching uh, process, non-server, but you know, those processes are similar enough. Um, this, the concept should apply to anything that needs to be patched. And I do use asset, machine, PC, computer, and workstation interchangeably. It should make sense though. So who am I? Um, I've been involved in the IT world since 1982, about 38 years experience. I was educated in Northern and Southern Ohio, uh, Kirtland, Ohio, about 20 miles east of Cleveland, uh, and Ohio University down in um, Athens, Ohio. Uh, my first job after graduating what, from Lakeland with a, a MIS degree uh, was helping a, a dad's friend code. He was about to retire. He didn't want to learn a new language, and I just happened to know where was learning that language, so we helped each other. Moved to Columbus in the early 90s. Since moving to Columbus, I've worked for three multi-billion dollar companies in healthcare, fast food, and, and a utility. Most of my uh, security was learned um, from an infrastructure group in a large utility, like I said. Uh, the group was responsible for everything related to workstation and mobility products. I've never worked in a cyber security group but I've worked on many cybersecurity projects. I like to think I know what they do from a high level. I participated in most security projects involve, involving workstation security over the last 30 years, patching, antivirus, HIPS, PAM, NAC, IPS, IDS, disk encryption, certificate authority, data classification, event viewer logging, secure FTP, group policy configurations, firewalls, uh, proxy servers, I probably missed a few. Uh, I, 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 I don't know the, all the gory details of all those processes, but I learned enough about them to understand what they do for the most part. Uh, my next slide has a corner line on top. Um, I've been doing patch management before it was a two word term. I started doing patch management probably late 90s, but early 80s, like I said earlier as a programmer, didn't like it too hard, so I didn't uh, work at it too much. Uh, mid 80s, I went to Ohio University and worked in uh, their, their labs. They had a PC lab and a Mac lab. I went down there to get into the business school, but my grade point wasn't high enough. And there was an alternate degree called the, uh, there's a Bachelor of Science in Communication Systems Management, CSMT. It was basically a business degree uh, or a telecom degree uh, emphasizing business. So I learned some networking to go along with my uh, MIS degree from Lakeland. Uh, mid and late 90s, I, I, in Columbus, I started off in uh, computer rooms working the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. shift. Last uh, computer room I worked in, there was a PC in the corner. It had Tivoli AF operator on it. 
I started playing all that and automating a lot of stuff and sending emails and messages. And next thing I know, I was working in the PC world. Um, it was at its infancy at that time, so it was pretty good timing. Companies just started to adopt computers, uh, all the good and bad that came along with it. Uh, during that time, I upgraded some regional offices for a restaurant chain from Windows uh, 3.1, which was non-networking, to Windows 95, which required a network. So we, you know, it was a project, inventory the systems, uh, got the new uh, PCs and the network equipment installed it, and did that over the whole year. Late 90s up till now, um, like I said, I'm, I'm a utility company, an engineering group, and uh, we are responsible for hardware, software, asset management. We evaluate, recommend, test, and maintain it. Do OS provisioning. We create the image that goes on the PCs in our uh, enterprise. I do patch management. Uh, other people in our group do uh, privilege access, pri PAM, privilege access management, basically removing uh, admin rights. Group policy, software delivery, uh, packaging, uh, there's a group for mobility, uh, and all the VDI equivalents of all that stuff. Um, let's see. So at that time, you can see uh, I just absorbed a lot of uh, cybersecurity activities. Uh, next slide. Um, this was at the bottom of the last slide. That other slide was getting a little busy. Uh, it shows the, the life cycles I've been involved with. You can see Windows 3.0 to 3.1, you know, patching was ad hoc it was you know we put all the patches in the image <coughs> pardon me and then patched it once in a while but not too much uh, when it was nt4 to 2000 i had developed the process a 30-day process but most of it was manual it did a lot of uh, scripting and um, database work with recording all the data and then around uh, uh you know 2000 to windows 10 it was a lot more automated um, you can tell I'm a Windows guy. Um, Microsoft has kept me employed for a very long time. Um, all right, so let's move on. Nine, okay, this is when I started patching. 1999, there were 8,000 PCs across 11 states and three locations. When I first started patching, there was no structure. Patches released when the vendor was ready. Firewalls, antivirus, and patching and some kind of email scanner uh, passed as security back in the late 90s. Uh, most of the bad people hadn't figured out what to do with their skills. And uh, once they did figure out they could make some money with it, uh, that's when things started to get rough. Um, so I had to make some sense of the whole mess. Uh, I had to create some structure. I created a monthly process that started on the first of every month. For example, the patches released from January 1 to January 31 were used to create a set of patches that would be deployed after testing. And I called that the patch batch. So January patches were February's patch batch. The short story is, like I said, I wrote VB script to inter interrogate the machines, see if the patches were needed um, that were from the patch batch. If so, install them, recorded that in the backend database. Um, so it could be uh, rendered in the web page. They downloaded from vendor, the, the, the downloads were from a vendor site to a DFS share uh, that was, uh, had 12 servers geographically distributed across the enterprise for faster downloads. The data, like I said, was recorded to a backend SQL database and it had a web front end so we can deliver some reports. Uh, we had a monthly change control that documented all our work with different tasks from uh, the different people that were involved. There was a large uh, contingent of field operations staff that did a lot of the testing. They weren't really application testers, but you know, they found a lot of uh, errors. Uh, actually, when they were doing it, uh, they found most of the errors. Um, and they found it because they were the ones that were responsible for fixing them if there was errors. So um, application management wasn't, uh, it was terrible. There was no software development life cycle. Uh, and they never retired apps and there was plenty of different versions of the same app everywhere. Um, our group oversaw the assets. Uh, the tools then were new. We weren't really that good at it, to be honest. And, you know, uh, we did what we could. Uh, main thing was I was not allowed to force reboots. For some reason, that was just uh, part of the culture that reboots were frowned upon, I guess. I don't know, but that's changed. Um, so let's move on. Flash forward to today. Um, 19,000. There's probably 20,000 PCs. I haven't updated this in a while. Uh, 11 states, the locations have increased somewhat. Um, I am using a patching compliance module from a 
configuration management tool. I use uh, the one from Avanti. Um, they're all the same. Uh, it's a tool. Uh, do the evaluations, find one that has all the features you want to use and uh, use it. It, uh, a lot of, look for the automation features. A lot of them do have uh, automation features that can uh, speed things up. Privilege access management was implemented in that time. We removed admin rights. That was big. Uh, inventory was a lot better. We got better at using the tools and we, uh, the machines, we were in charge of getting clients. We put the clients on the machines so we, and we were pretty diligent at that. There was, uh, we still use change management to communicate and document the process. Uh, you can see there's plenty of different ones out there. I'm sure your company has one, uh, but uh, it is automated now. So every, I think it's on the 8th of every month, it's automatically created with uh, a number of different tax, tasks with a number of different groups involved. That's nice because it's all consolidated in one place. The, there are uh, security groups now that are, uh, have a major influence in patching. Vulnerability management group is the one I work with a lot, the closest with. And uh, the SDLC, the software development life cycle, is, um, it's a little better. Uh, it's always being worked on. It's one of the hardest things to get going, but it is one of the things that is worth improving. We'll get into that later. Uh, so I went over these last set of slides, things change. And what I've learned over time is, I like that little transition, a solid patch management process makes cybersecurity easier. I'm not sure if solid, solid was the right word, so I should have said any, so I learned to automate, or um, what do you call it? Uh, animate. So I did any, any patch management helps. The goal of patch management is to reduce the attack surface caused by hardware and software vulnerabilities. Your attack surface is increased with every vulnerability that exists in your environment. I found the easiest and most effective way to reduce the attack surface is to fix the vulnerability. That's what patching does. The driving force behind patch patching is a risk management decision based on your company's tolerance to leaving machines unpatched and vulnerable to attack. If you have a low risk tolerance, you probably want a fast turnaround in patching. If your risk tolerance is infinite, you'll never patch. I don't recommend that. Just means that you're, you know, if you're high risk, high risk tolerance, you're not going to pass patch as fast. Um, you got to decide what solid means. Like I said, it's subjective. So you want to, should your cycle be 15 days, 20 days, 30 days? Should you measure the time of patch? Can you get 90% saturation in a week, two weeks, three weeks? Those are the things you have to decide and uh, weigh toward what a solid is. So how do you make Patch management easier and cybersecurity easier. There are three things that I'm going to focus on today. Remember that things and air quotes, and that is software, hardware, and user. Managing these three things goes a long way to reducing your company's attack surface. Most of some of the information may not be new. What I want to do is have you look at it from the patching guy's perspective. So patching. In order to move forward, we have to agree on what patching is. And I like this definition. I, I don't know. I made it up, I guess. Patching, applying fixes and or updates to technology at set intervals to maintain and secure optimal operation. Uh, notice that I did say technology. I know it is, my job was patching workstations, but a lot of this can be applied to just generalized technology that needs to be updated. And the intervals is what makes it a process. So, I found this out. Patching becomes easier as a variance of things to patch decrease. Look at all the things you got you to patch. Windows OS, Mac OS and apps, Linux, mobility apps, hardware, software, apps, all the apps for that, third-party software, network stuff, database stuff, storage stuff. Here's my, another animation. Oh my, it does get complicated. And uh, at, a lot, at a modern business, large and small with remote locations, and in a web presence, you know, all this stuff is, is there. You need to patch it. So this slide, this is uh, one of the color slides. It's pretty obvious. Um, it's a little abstract. Um, does anybody know what this stuff has in common? Type it into the chat window there. I should be online. Uh, these are the related activities, processes, and additional things uh, that can affect the monthly patch process. I don't think the list is all encompassing. I, uh, I've been adding it and thinking over the years. Uh, I just added AI recently. There was a scanner that had some new uh, uh, 
artificial intelligence functionality, like a slider, and they turned it up a little too far and it stops on my patch downloads. Um, I added cloud recently. Uh, I did see some cool stuff on uh, analytics where uh, they can analyze your company and come up with a representative set of test machines that hits most or all of the applications in the environment. Uh, the animals one I thought was interesting. Uh, uh, we have a fiber network that goes down every once in a while because of gunshots. Uh, in hunting season, if a bird's sitting on a wire, sometimes people shoot at it. Um, all right. Weather, weather is another frequent in interrupter where I work utility. If there's a storm, the restoration uh, efforts, uh, they ask me to carefully monitor the patching during that time. Uh, I can keep the west and east and south and north separate, so it is a little bit uh, easy to do that way. Uh, DNS has been on there for a while, but that's been in there for the news. Um, last week, I guess, uh, we had uh, there was an emergency patch that uh, had to go out and it went out. That is the end of the first section. Now let's talk about the things. These are the things that can have an impact on patching. It's not a complete list, just the ones I have time to talk about. Remember, they can have a negative or positive effect. Depending on the size of your organization, these activities could be a few people's responsibilities or many different groups' responsibilities. Many of these points are based off processes that you may have up and running. Some can be, some can be considered computer hygiene or maintenance or asset management, whatever you want to call it. And a lot of times this stuff gets overlooked or hasn't been looked at for a while. Later on, I'll get into more detailed explanation of how improvements here benefit the patching process. All these points are relevant, but the top three or four have the greatest ability to influence patching. Those are the three I'm going to spend the most time on. The last four I'm just going to mention. App management. At some point in the future, it's, it will be the most critical thing to manage. The virtualization of applications will allow apps to be run anywhere on any platform. User management, there's a couple things, three things there. Admin rights, permissions, and auditing. Hardware management, configuration, hardware management. Some of the important things are configuration management and risk classification. Network uh, condition, network condition matters. And it get pretty expensive to try to keep up with uh, user demand. Security products, security products can uh, cause patching to stop. Think about it. Patching acts like what security products look for. It hits a machine, downloads a package, EXE or MSI, executes the download, reports back to command and control. If those products aren't configured correctly, security software stops patching to some degree. Enterprise culture and C-level buy-in are a little more uh, abstract, but well worth the effort since uh, culture directly deals with the end user. All right, so this is it, managing applications. Standardize, standardize, standardize. It's all about the apps. Get to know application support and development people. Apps are what business, businesses run on. It's all about the apps. As virtualization takes over, app management is going to be even more important. At some point in the future, we'll all be supporting apps in one way or another. The hardware layer won't be a consideration as much as it is today. People will get to work on whatever device they're comfortable with and virtualization plays a hard, uh, key role in that. So with applications, a software, having a software development lifecycle is a must. Application lifecycle, call it what you want, is about managing your applications and uh, keeping production versions consistent and retiring old applications. If I could work at a place that used one app, think about it. If the attack surface is reduced, you don't have three different versions of a PDF reader. Uh, testing takes less time, all the different configurations that you should test it on, but you know, time permitting, you do the best you can. Number of patches is smaller, so uh, burden on the network is reduced. Having a formal support and testing structure in place for every piece of software is critical. Know who supports what. Um, hours of time can be wasted looking for who supports the broken app. <clears throat> the disk, uh, data and risk classification. Apply a risk score to software products. It's nice to know what applications are critical to operating a business. The, that can help uh, prioritize what to patch or maybe uh, creating a special group for those uh, critical apps. Could be a, a, a 
process you undertake to isolate them and make sure they get patched in a more timely manner. Assigning risk cut, uh, we talked about that. Who accessed what app and when, that's um, identity and access management. I'm using it as a general term. Um, it's a powerful tool used to control and unlog access. Uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, least privilege principle, only give them uh, access to what they need, uh, especially for process IDs. Um, all this information that I am uh, gathers is help for doing trouble resolution and to keep an eye on what users are doing, especially if they have admin rights or you have to do some forensics on a, 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 a machine that's been uh, compromised. Configuration management database, that stuff's important, lets you know uh, software usage. If they're not using it, uh, take it away. Sometimes, you know, licensed software can get pretty expensive and if people don't use it, you can manage it through uh, that, those methods. So managing software helps with testing, deployment, and network usage. The user, the two main points here, are admin rights and uh, IAM again. Understand the difference between admin rights and permissions. Think of it like this, you can be an admin on a machine, but you still need permission to access applications. And depending on who you ask, uh, removing admin rights stops up to about 95% of malware. I think that's a little bit high, but uh, it's just a figure. Uh, admin rights allow the user or the hacker to do anything they want in the system. Make it easy to give and remove admin rights. You don't want someone who has just fired your admin rights for a very long time, especially if they're disgruntled. Admin rights are what uh, hackers and malware uh, are after. When malware is run with admin rights, inherited from a logged in user or uh, elevated through a vulnerability, the malware hacker can do anything to that machine. And depending on the network access of the uh, rights they get, uh, it may make it much easier to move laterally, laterally through your network. If possible, only supply admin rights when needed, the principle of least privilege again. And you could even take it further to the zero trust framework where nothing is trusted. That's a pretty simple, simplified explanation of it, but the privilege of least principle and zero trust frameworks uh, take additional effort, but they're, they're, they might be a little outside of patch management. They're, they're well worth the effort. Mobility, remember mobility, uh, that's a whole nother aspect of patching, all the different uh, mobility products out there and. Uh, the access the user has and what rights they have. Um, uh, some regulatory requirements uh, require a business unit in a regular area uh, have, that cannot talk to each other. We, there's one in our area where we have an unregulated side that can't talk to a regulated side. Um, so uh, regulatory requirements are in consideration when, when it comes to users. The hardware, again, standardized, standardized, standardized. You need to understand what you're up against by having an accurate inventory of unique models and systems on the network. Each model usually has its own driver set, BIOS updates, chipsets, buses, network adapters, uh, wired Wi-Fi, you get the point. Remember the variance of things principle, the more models running on the network, the more effort required to do that, to test and patch and track all the different vulnerabilities. So standardization helps reduce the workloads. Standardized, that's one thing I tell you about hardware. Don't have three different vendors. Minimize the choices. It helps reduce the attack surface. Why have Microsoft or IBM and Lenovo in there? Uh, all that different choices require a lot more testing, a lot more uh, patching. Just like a life cycle is crucial for software, have a hardware life cycle. It's just as important. Helps keep old and sometimes unsupported hardware off the network. How many years you should wait between the, ref the refresh? is a risk management decision. Once you decide that, should you forklift, do it all at once, do have a rolling life cycle, do 25% of your machines every, every, every year. Uh, that's something you need to decide. Um, audit, audit activities on the asset, usually through event logs, or you can use third-party software to do that. Um, a big one here is assigning a risk score based on data for data classification. Risk scores are determined by the apps running on the server or what kind of data is on the database. Helps you decide which ones to monitor more closely and helps determining your patching schedule, usually putting the critical ones first. Vendor relations has been in the news lately. Uh, as a possible attack vendor, many vendors, attack vector, many vendors want access to their Linux security appliances or non-Linux security appliances. Uh, verify um, who they are and, and, and look at their security posture before you let them on your network. 
Uh, again, some, some regulations require systems be in locked cages. Uh, we have a uh, regular retirement from NERC, which is a, a regulates the electrical industry where these critical assets have to be in a physically locked cage. Um, so there's a lot of considerations in that area too for hardware. Uh, we'll touch upon the network. These, uh, we hit on the first three, spend a little detail on those. These last one I'm gonna to touch upon, network condition matters. Uh, network condition can have a major impact on success or failure and is usually out of your control. It's usually related to patch downloads or port closures. Uh, get to know the people who run the network. Have a good friend at your 24-7 uh, knock or sock, uh, whatever you want to call it. Make sure you can have someone to call when, when you uh, come across some uh, network issues. Have a formalized process in place for issue reporting, escalation, and resolution. If needed, uh, have a police an uh, analogy, you could call a SWAT. You get all the interested people together to come to uh, some trouble resolution. You should know all your ingress and egress points and how data flows through them. The VPN connection has been in the spotlight with all of us working from home lately. It also has hampered uh, my ability to query for accurate patch groups because there's not a lot of whole information on our end that comes through that can distinguish the VPN user and where they are. Um, make sure the network can handle the traffic. Um, I think every network has slow links, know where they are. Um, when you're patching, if you have a big patch batch, uh, that could hamper uh, network performance or getting the patches and machines. You can have 24 hour baselines uh, determined uh, to see where bandwidth is available or how it's used, and then monitor those deviations from baselines to know where you can patch. Um, understand when network bandwidth is available and not available. Remote locations can have low bandwidth that, that do cause some patching issues. Um, I didn't know where to put this slide. Uh, I had talked about regulations and frameworks for a while. These are some of the regulatory standards and industrial frameworks um, that are out there. Regular, regulatory standards are requirements you must meet to work in certain industries, and frameworks are standards you choose to implement. For example, this has a good patch management framework that you can follow. Uh, any company you follow, whereas HIPAA has uh, regulatory requirements if you're in the medical industry that you have to abide by. I tell you the truth, I don't know what all those mean, uh, but my point here is that if you're in an industry, know what the regulatory requirements are because uh, they can be very time consuming to meet. Security products, know their processes and understand their protocols. The key is to have uh, process and people in place for quick and easy collaboration, escalation, and a resolution. Um, all this security stuff can affect patching. When I say protocols, I mean the actual practices and procedures and who leads them. And it's also nice to know what, what protocols different software uses and what different security products use. And um, knowing the ports just helps in general if you're gonna be a patch person. Uh, the key is to knowing what these products do and what kind of effects they can have on patching. And most importantly, make sure you have a contact point for every security product in your environment. Uh, the next slide might tie the last few together, uh, software, hardware, user security, and how it's all interrelated. Um, I might be getting a little outside of patch management here, but all this stuff, but I put all this on one slide to show there is some overlap in hardware and software and some of the processes and to show that it all runs uh, on the network. And being aware of all this, being aware of all this helps me to patch. Get to know the software, hardware, users, and networks used to access and protect data. As a patch person, you're exposed to all groups in the company. You reach out and touch every PC every month. I've learned that patching is the first thing everyone looks at when there is an issue. I'm assuming many, not, uh, I'm assigned many non-patching trouble tickets. So understand the basics of all this help you perform the job. It also helps you to know who you can reassign tickets to when one is er erroneously routed to. Get to know the computing environment. Get to know how it works, especially security products and processes. Uh, eventually, at some point, uh, the, if you're patching, you'll run into some issues with them. Okay, these, um, I'm just gonna touch upon these last three. I feel like I shortchanged them. Uh, they're a little more abstract than the first three. 
three and a half with half of networking, I include that. Um, the higher on the org chart the message comes from, the greater probability of success. People seem to listen to C-level executives. The higher on the org chart the message comes from, the more likely employees will listen. I have two mails about an upcoming security event, one from, a, from the sysadmin that is performing the work, the other from the CEO. Which one is read more? I'll put my money on the CEO note. Um, cybersecurity is discussed at many board meetings now. It, it used to be pretty hard to get time for security at, the, at that level. Uh, that's changing uh, cost, uh, thanks to the cost of rising breaches. People are still the weakest link. Make sure patching is talked about, encouraged, and rewarded. This is about culture. Train your people. They are usually the weakest link and will probably always be the weakest link. Teach them about security. Even a basic online course can help. And making it mandatory might help them understand the importance of patching or some or even some companies are making cybersecurity a criteria in their bonus structure. It is very serious. Uh, let them know what you're doing and, uh, and when you're doing it. Uh, make patching a habit, tell people why it's so important, uh, and, and uh, telling them why it's so important can, can make them care. Having a month of calendar available for end users to check uh, patching and security events is a step toward that end. Uh, make it easier to report issues. The easier it is to report issues, the faster you can resolve them. Done with the second section, let's talk about the process. I like that transition. When I started patching, I thought 30-day cycle would be plenty of time to download, test, and deploy patches to the environment. It still is a 30-day cycle, but it's said instead of starting on the first of the month, today's starting date for each month is Patch Tuesday. Microsoft started labeling the second Tuesday of each month, Patch Tuesday. This is the date that they release most of their patches. Many other software vendors also post their patches on that date as well. I'm not gonna go over all the details of the process. I'll hit a few important ones along the way. Um, I will have a bunch of bullets in my notes when I post this uh, presentation. You can look at those. Um, throughout the Process, communication is important. We talked about it here and there, but good communication about what is going on cannot be neglected. With that in mind, these are the things I do to inform and document what happens every month. We may have touched on these a little earlier, but this is a little more detail. Change management, one monthly master change with assignable tasks to detail all the activities from all the groups involved. That can be automated. We, uh, it is automated where I work and it is worth automating uh, the workflows, a lot of the new uh, ServiceNow and uh, a couple of other, I don't remember the other ones' names, but they all have workflow automation you can use. Uh, monthly email released on the first day of patch cycle with links to patching details and resources. On Patch Tuesday or shortly after, an email is sent to IT managers, app support managers, app people, help desk, security groups, and business unit contacts. That email provides details on testing timeline, patches to, to be deployed, the schedule, who to call with issues. Um, formalized communication between, uh, from, for, formalized communication channels between all groups involved, uh, engineering, help desk, app support, network, and security. Over the years, I found it uh, beneficial to know the other players that the patching process can cause work for. For example, if there is an issue, the help desk gets inundated with uh, calls. Um, the patching website, uh, we've been over that a little bit. It has the deployment schedule and links to the change control and uh, uh, the who, to, who to call with issues. Um, announced testing and uh, patching schedule and CAB meeting. CAB meeting is a change advisory board meeting. Um, a lot of companies have a, a daily one that uh, if you have a change coming up for that day or the next few days, you announce it. We do that regularly with uh, the patching. Uh, workstation server and what other, any other group that does do uh, patching. Um, during this testing period, robust testing environment is important. Um, I generally provide about eight working days for patch testing. Uh, but let me say, if, it's a, if there is an emergency, de emergency deployment declared because of active code exploiting a zero day vulnerability, the testing window could be reduced to zero. Usually about three days is what we 
test on with it zero day. Um, testing is critical. The purpose of testing is to find and fix issues in the small test groups prior to deploying them to the enterprise. The time it takes to test has a direct correlation to the variety of things in things to test. So remember that less variety, less time. As variety goes up, so does testing time. As the models of hardware and versions of software running in your environment increase, so does the complexity and time to test. Ideally, you should test all versions of all software on all hardware models, but that is not practical. You make your best effort to test the most prevalent configurations in your environment and be ready for um, unexpected remediations. For instance, you could have a task in the change management that uh, you can enter all the issues into and if uh, like the one we used I could follow it and anytime anybody adds anything to that, to that task I get an email. You can never have enough uh, application and patch testers make it easy to join and leave the patch testing groups. Uh, I have a query for an AD group that is for patch testers and if you're in that group you're a tester. It makes it really easy to uh, keep track of the patch testers. Um, it's critical to test all the functionality of an application after patching. Um, it's not that hard. You launch, launch the app, sign in if necessary, use the app and report the issues. And that can all be automated. Um, if some groups uh, don't have a testing environment, you can provide a testing environment. Uh, it is, there is some cost to it and time and money to set up a virtual workstation uh, a set of workstations that testers can use with the different flavors and operating systems and stuff. So uh, it might be worth setting it up uh, for some critical apps that don't have uh, that kind of testing environment. Again, now we're going to deployment. Remember, it's important to tell the people what you're doing. And hey, people, I'm about to bake your PC. Um, if there's a patching problem, you can hear about it. Uh, like I said, uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it comes in big groups. If there's an issue that uh, didn't get caught in testing, it, the help desk gets inundated and I get called. Uh, the deployment is a stage deployment with small batch of assets that I add to and get bigger and bigger. It starts on the last day of the testing day, ends on the next month's deployment start date. I start by turning the tasks I use for testing into the production tasks and try to uh, try to keep those uh, number of groups down to a minimum. If you have too many groups, the queries get hard to manage. Uh, you get tend to get a, lot, a few machines in a lot of different groups. So if I can say one thing, keep your groups to a minimum. Um, it's much easier to patch one group than managing all the, like let's say for 10 groups, you got to manage that schedule and queries. So remember, keep those groups to a minimum. Uh, monitor your console and help desk calls. Uh, I found that once the word is out about uh, patching, a lot of the issues um, that are out there become patching issues. So if you get a ticket, you can spot check that machine and see if it got patched. You can cross-reference the, the, the machines that were patched that day uh, to the I issues coming in. And if you, if you see something like that, that could help. Um, have a remediation plan to handle, handle the issues that you find. Um, that would help in the long run to, to get all the groups involved and who to call and stuff. Uh, one of the important things I found out uh, you need is rebooting and sometimes that uh, bothers people. Make sure you can control and configure the reboots. Uh, having the ability to set parameters is important. Most of the new patching tools do have the ability to set configuration like time to time it can reboot when it can't reboot. Um, if you don't make people reboot, a certain percentage won't and they will complain when you force them. If you use as admin rights, they can stop patching completely. So remember it's important to remove admin rights. Some patches are not installed until the system is rebooted. Attack surface is not reduced when a system sits in a pending reboot state and the machine is left sitting in an unstable state. Pardon me. They should, uh, what's the next one? There should be a way to mark machines as do not reboot. Uh, so in this case, if you have a machine you can't reboot, make sure they fill out risk exception. I don't know if we talked about that yet, um, but it should be filled out for, by the party that is requesting the stoppage. No matter how hard you try, someone's always gonna have an asset that can't be rebooted. 
have them fill out a form, the risk exemption form info should include the name contact, the asset name, how long will a stoppage be, are there mitigating circumstances in place of the patch, um, all that stuff is pretty important to know. Uh, make sure your people know the difference between reboot and log off. Um, sometimes you can set a job up, you want to set a job up uh, to work when uh, no one's logged in. Uh, and, and, and if people don't know the difference between logging off and rebooting or signing out, you, you can run into some issues. Um, again, I'll go to the bottom one, clearing out memory and temp files. Reboots help with that. It keeps the machine running better. Uh, let's move on. After the deployment, the post-deployment, by this time, you're also doing some pre-work for the next cycle. So compare your stats with the security groups, uh, installs, failed installs, machines, missing patches, etc. Uh, I usually work with the security groups to see if our stats match. Uh, verify patches did indeed install. Uh, this is where you can spot check bigger uh, groups of machine just to validate the installs. Uh, check your geographic footprint just to make sure. Uh, investigate and remediate failed. Investigate and remediate failed installs. Investigating or remediating failed installs is very time-consuming. Uh, you could get lucky and find a trend where you know you you know you patch location X and you see all those office versions are broken that office. Um, it, that would be pretty obvious, but a lot of times they're one-off machines and it does take a lot of time to remediate them. Uh, complete and uh, close your change control. Uh, closing monthly change control and, uh, and verifying all support documents are attached is important. A lot of times that information can be used for audit purposes or is used for audit purposes. So this last slide, let's tie it all together. That slide is a little dizzy in there, so wrap it up. Managing the big three will go a long way in reducing the attack surface. Patching becomes easier as your attack surface decreases. The application standardized application lifecycle process helps that only the latest versions of all apps should be in production eliminate duplicate apps Microsoft Office is a prime example don't have office 16 19 and 10 classify for criticality helps you determine uh, what to patch first only give access to people who use the app and if they don't use it take it away hardware standardized keep model choices to a minimum and audit usage Life cycle is, is uh, critical for keeping unsupported and hardware off your network. Users, remove admin rights, control, or at least monitor usage for critical apps and hardware for future forensic investigations or audits. Getting these basics in order makes patching easier, mainly by reducing attack surface, network usage, and the time it takes to patch. And I, oh, I did include uh, some uh, visual, another color slide. This is just a swim lane chart. You can go through these uh, if you want. It basically says all of what I said um, in a visual form to some extent. Uh, this is, I like that, is my, one of my favorite transitions. This is another timeline thing where it shows where everything overlaps. And um, I think we have time for some questions. So that was the end. And thanks for listening.